Now we're going to talk about solutions. So in chemistry, we use solutions a lot. And one of the reasons we like to uh, use solutions is because that's the best medium to carry out a chemical reaction. If your chemicals are in the gas phase, they can react very well, okay? They're bouncing off walls, and they come in contact, and they react, right? If they hit each other, and they can react. So, but the, the rate of the reaction is dependent on the number of collisions that are occurring in that gas phase. So if I heat it up, more collisions are happening, and the rate of the reaction goes faster, okay? However, if I just simply carry out that chemical reaction in the liquid phase, then um, in that phase, the collisions, because the molecules are touching, are increased a thousand times fold, and the chemical reactions will occur even faster in the liquid phase than in the gas phase. So, but in the solid state, if I have two solid things and I put them right next to each other, the rate of the reaction will be very slow, right? Because all that's reacting is the things on the surface. The two surfaces are all that's touching. So, and, you know, the rate not going, of the reaction is going to be very slow. Because everything else can't even react around it inside. So the surface area is also formed. So if I dissolve those things into a solution, into water, then the surface area has been increased um, a million fold more, and they can react much more easily. So obviously solid phase worse, gas phase is better, but not as effective as the liquid phase. That's why we want to use solutions. And a solution is essentially a homogeneous mixture. So you have uh, these um, particles that dissolve into the water, if that's your um, solvent, and uh, they become homogeneous, meaning the same concentration throughout the entire mixture. It doesn't matter if you take a sample at the top or the bottom, they will be the same. Okay? Now, a few vocabulary. Solute, the substance in the mixture in the less, lesser quantity. The lesser amount. Solvent, the substance present in the largest quantity, the greater amount. So if I dissolve salt into water, what's the solute and what's the solvent? Good. Solute is the salt, solvent is the water. The water dissolves the salt. The water's in the greater quantity. Okay? Now, water is not always the solvent, but for the majority of things, it is. Okay? And we would say if it's dissolved in water, we would say it's an aqueous solution. A water solution is an aqueous solution. Solutions can be other liquids as well. Okay? And also, it doesn't have to, so a solution doesn't have to only be in the liquid phase, it can also be in the gas phase. So, um, the air right now is a solution. It's a solution of gases. What's the solvent? What's in the greatest quantity? That's what they're asking. No. Yes. Okay. What? What do you say? Nitrogen. Yes. Okay. Nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen. The gaseous solvent is nitrogen of air. So most of our atmosphere is made up of nitrogen gas. And dissolved into that nitrogen gas are things like oxygen and carbon dioxide. Uh, and other trace amounts of things like hydrogen and, and so forth, okay? So, that's the majority, though, of the gas is the nitrogen. So, when we burn something in air, it, it actually doesn't react with the nitrogen. Why? It reacts with the oxygen. Well, it's because nitrogen has a triple bond 
and oxygen has a double bond. And so oxygen is more reactive than nitrogen. That's why when we burn something, it reacts with the oxygen, not the nitrogen. Now, you could heat it up enough so that it does react with the nitrogen. And in fact, in your car engine, you do get some of those nitrogenous um, molecules that are made. But your catalytic converters and things filter those out so that the, the noxious, the toxic nitrogen molecules that are created in your car engine aren't pumped out into the atmosphere. Okay, other examples of mixtures, solids like metals, so um, alloys like brass, those would be mixtures of metals. They would be these alloys uh, where you heat up the metals, you mix them together, and you cool them down into a, an alloy. Okay? But we're going to focus on liquid solutions for the most part. Okay. <clears throat> So, properties of liquid solutions, they're clear, they're transparent. Um, you cannot see the particles. So, if everything is dissolved into it, you can't see the particles. If you see particles, then they have come out of solution. Those particles are no longer in solution. They have come out. We call that a precipitate. Okay, we talked about precipitates where we form a solid product. Those are coming out of solution, those are no longer part of the solution once they come out. Okay, they are a solid product. They have separated themselves from the water. Okay, so um, sodium chloride is an example of something that you would dissolve and it would become uh, an electrolyte dissolved into water. So we'd say sodium plus aqueous and chlorine aqueous because they're dissolved in water. <coughs> Volumes are not um, summable. You can't add the volumes together. So if I have one liter of ethanol and one liter of water and I mix them together, it doesn't come out to be two liters of solution. It actually, because the molecules, the water molecules and the ethanol molecules start to mix, and the volume will actually drop from two liters. It'll actually be like one point or something like that, liters, instead of two liters. So you can't just assume that you're going to have two liters of a solution after you add one liter of ethanol plus one liter of water. Okay. Colloidals. Those are bigger particles. They're big particles. And you can't see them unless you shine a light on them. You shine light through the solution and it illuminates that part where the light's going through, um, then that is a colloidal solution because those big colloidal particles are become visible, uh, and not due to their large size. Okay? And that's called the Tyndale effect. So the Tyndale effect, if I shine the light here, I see the illuminated particles. The light is still passing through this solution as well, but I don't see it, right? Because this one is not a colloidal solution. It's a solution, just not a colloidal solution, whereas this one is a colloidal solution. That's why I see this illuminated area right there. If you're walking through the brush and the light, the sun is shining through, it illuminates the dust particles. That's the Tyndale effect. Essentially, that's what they're talking about. And then all of a sudden, you, you see all the dust particles that you're inhaling and breathing, walking back there. And for your allergies. Okay. Solubility. So, the degree to which something will dissolve in solution um, is how we would define its degree of solubility. So, if, it, if more of it dissolves in solution per so many grams of water, then it's, it's a more soluble substance. So, everything will reach a point to where no more of it will dissolve. So at room temperature, I have my water at room temperature, and I start dumping salt in it. And the salt is dissolving, it's dissolving, and I leave it there all day. And all I come back and it's, it's all dissolved. And then I dump more salt in it, and more starts to dissolve. Um, and I come back the next day, 
and there's still some left over at the bottom that has not dissolved. That is because I have dissolved as much salt into that water as it will possibly hold. It will not hold any more salt. Yeah, so the, the stuff on the bottom is the excess salt. Okay, it does not dissolve, or I should say, it has reached an equilibrium. So when I say equilibrium, what I mean is that it's actually still dissolving, but it appears to me that nothing is happening because the dissolution of that part of that salt. So here's my water. There's salt particles on the bottom. They're dissolving at a rate that is equal to the rate at which it's precipitating out of solution. It's going in and out, in and out, in and out at the exact same rate. So it has reached equilibrium. It's not that it stopped dissolving. It's just that no more than what is there will actually ever change. That amount will never change because it's dissolving as fast as it's precipitating. Okay. And so we say that's a saturated solution. A saturated solution, a solution that contains all the solids that can be dissolved. Now salt might reach its saturation state later than another. Um, so sodium chloride salt, might, I might be able to dissolve, let's say, 50 grams and 100 grams of water. Whereas with another salt like um, potassium chloride, maybe I can only dissolve 30 grams of sodium chloride in 100 grams of water. So the solubility of sodium chloride would be greater than the solubility of uh, potassium chloride. Okay? But that 30 grams is when it reaches its equilibrium state. So, uh, <clears throat> now, a supersaturated solution would be where all that extra salt that has them dissolved, well, what I do is I heat up the solution and it starts to dissolve. Because as you increase the temperature, the solubility becomes greater. So it dissolves, and then I cool it down very carefully, and it remains in the solution. It doesn't. It, now I call it a <coughs> supersaturated solution. It contains more solids than can be dissolved at the current temperature. Now, it's very sensitive. So if I even go over and I just like knock that container a little bit or shake it, all that salt will just fall right out of solution. Okay? Because it's just barely being held in there. Or if I take one single salt crystal and I drop it in, then all the salt, all the extra salt that's in there will precipitate out. Okay, that's called a seed crystal. I should show that. <laughs> that's, that's a wonderful thing you guys could do at home. Okay. Have fun. Okay. Um, so equilibrium. That's when it when it gets to that saturated state. A saturated solution is an example of that equilibrium state. Okay. When it's reached that equilibrium state. Now gases. <coughs> Gases dissolve into water as well. So you can dissolve a gas into water. And the best example is uh, your soda. So there's a bunch of carbon dioxide gas dissolved into that soda. And that's why it's called soda, because you have carbon dioxide in water. Okay? And to keep that uh, carbon dioxide in there, follow Henry's law. The number of moles of a gas dissolved in a liquid at a given temperature is proportional to the partial pressure of that individual gas above the liquid, not of all the gases above the liquid. So if I have oxygen and nitrogen and etc. above that liquid and there's a pressure of those being exerted on that liquid, they are not those uh, nitrogen and oxygen are not affecting the pressure of the, or the concentration of carbon dioxide dissolved into the water. It is only carbon dioxide that is affecting carbon dioxide in the water. 
nitrogen and oxygen are affecting the nitrogen and oxygen gas in the water. Okay? So if I want to keep my soda carbonated, then I have to have a pressure of carbon above that liquid for it to, to stay carbonated. So if uh, this is my bottle, okay, and right here there is a CO2 gas. Oops, what am I doing? Okay, there's CO2 gas right there. And in here is CO2 dissolved into the water. And that carbon dioxide is being held in there because it has reached an equilibrium state where once a particle leaves, another one comes in. And so it has reached another dynamic equilibrium. So the pressure of the gas above it is um, determining the concentration of the gas in the solution. So what happens if I lower the pressure of carbon dioxide above this solution? What's going to happen to the concentration of carbon dioxide? If I lower the concentration of the pressure, or sorry, if I lower the pressure, the, car the concentration will also decrease. Okay? So more of these would escape before it would reach a new equilibrium. So this, that's what happens when you guys open your soda bottle. All that pressurized carbon dioxide that the soda company put on top of your soda, you open it and that escapes. Comes right out. And then you close it back up and carbon dioxide does what? It reaches a new equilibrium, so the next time you go back, not all the carbon dioxide is gone out of your soda, but it's not as bubbly. What's that? Nope. No, if, if you put the cap back on, so if you opened it, let all that carbon dioxide gas escape, and then put the cap right back on, the concentration of the carbon dioxide in the solution would decrease, because it would have to some would have to escape into that void that you just created to create a new equilibrium. Well, not if you put the cap on and be still, and it would be okay. But you would go drink it, and it wouldn't be as carbon. And if I drink some of it, I decrease the volume and increase the volume of the void, and now it has to fill that volume after I put my cap back on right, has to fill that volume until it reaches that new equilibrium, and so a lot of carbon dioxide has escaped from here to fill that void. And every time I open it, I release that pressure above it, and it decreases the concentration more and more. Yeah. Okay, if you put your soda in the freezer, it would explode because water uh, because water expands. Right? Water itself, when it freezes, it gets bigger. And the same thing happens in your car. If you don't have antifreeze in your car, you have water in your car, and it freezes, then you bust your engine because the water expands in your car and it busts the engine, right? So you have to get that antifreeze that doesn't freeze in your car, so uh, your engine doesn't bust. Okay, so, but that's why it explodes, because the, not because of the gas, it's because the water expands, it gets bigger. So same thing would happen if you put that water bottle in the freezer and it was completely full of water, and you put it in the freezer, that top would bust right off of there uh, once it froze because uh, the water would expand. Jelly? <laughs> okay. Good to know. But if it if it does that, it's because the water is expanding in the jelly. Okay? So it's the expansion of the water. Water becomes less dense 
Water floats, right? Because it's less dense in the solid state than it is in the liquid state. That's why it expands, because it becomes less dense when it expands. Okay. So now if I left the cap off of this and I just let it sit there, eventually all the carbon dioxide would escape. And it would become completely flat, and then it would just be some sugar water, and you would throw it away. Because you don't want to drink sugar water unless it's carbonated, right? That's right. I don't drink sugar water unless it's carbonated. I won't drink Kool-Aid unless it's carbonated. Okay? So, that's, that's how you guys feel about it. Okay. But that's... Um, you pressurize it with carbon dioxide above it. And that would dissolve carbon dioxide into it. So before they, before they, there's, there's a couple of ways. Actually, you can do with dry ice. You could put a little dry ice in your water, and that dry ice would evaporate, and it would carbonate the space above and below it. But you have to be really careful with that, because if you put too much dry ice in there, it's going to explode. Okay? So, but that's one way you can carbonate something. Or if you just put dry ice in an open container, uh, it will still carbonate it for a little while. No. Baking soda. Also, if you drop baking soda and heat it up, it will produce carbon dioxide. That will carbonate a soda. You could create a, a soda. That's why they call it baking soda. And the soda, the carbonate, the carbon dioxide could be created in that soda solution. It might. Depends on the concentration that you use. Sure. Yeah, the, the smell it deodorizes. It can sort of deodorize itself. That's why. Okay. <coughs> no, it works on anything that's not stinky. Okay. Um, so the con concentration of something is basically the amount of solute dissolved into a uh, given amount of a solution. This is an intrinsic property. It's intrinsic. Intrinsic. Meaning what? Independent of the amount. It's intrinsic, so therefore it is independent of the amount. So, if I have a big bucket and a little cup, and this bucket's full of a solution, let's say, and it's at a very specific concentration of solute within that uh, amount, let's say this is one liter of solution, and I have 100 grams of something in here, 100 grams per liter. I take this little cup and I fill it with this solution, okay? The concentration in the cup is still 100 grams per liter. The concentration does not change between here and here, okay? This is 100 grams per liter. This is 100 grams per liter. It's intrinsic. It is independent of the amount. Concentration is independent, okay? Sure, this is one liter and there's 100 grams in it, but if this is um, point, let's say this is a this is a thousand milliliters, and this is uh, ten milliliters. Let's do a hundred milliliters and ten milliliters. Okay, there's five grams in a hundred milliliters. Okay, how many grams would be in ten milliliters if I put it in here? Exactly. That's all it is. It's a ratio. Okay. That's exactly what it is. That's what concentration is. It's the ratio uh, per, per liter. Okay? So I haven't changed. So this is 5 grams in um, 100 milliliters. Okay? And I have, down here, I have 10 milliliters. How many grams would be in that 10 milliliters if there's 5 grams in every 100 here? Well, you, this is 10 times different, right? So divide this by 10, 0 0.5 grams. And if I take 5 divided by 100, what do I get? Sorry. 
All right. And if I get 0.5 divided by 10, I get the same thing. They're equal to the same thing. It's the same, like you said, it's a ratio. Okay? So concentration tells us how much of something there is per volume of that. Now, there's a number of ways that we look at um, concentration. So this is one of them. Percent uh, weight per volume percent. Okay? This is, be given, this is given to you on your equation sheet. You might have seen it. Grams of solid over milliliters of solution times 100. That's mass per volume percent. That's pretty easy, right? If I know the grams of the solid and the milliliters of the solution, then I can determine the mass per volume percent. So there's an example here. Okay, here. Calculate the percent composition or mass per volume percent of 200 milliliters containing 20 grams of sodium chloride. 20 grams of sodium chloride. That's my mass of the solute, because that's the thing in the lesser amount, right? Divided by 200 milliliters. What do I get? Yeah, I get 0 0.01 grams per milliliter, but I have to multiply that by two, by 100 to make it a percent, and I get 10% uh, sodium chloride solution. It's a 10% sodium chloride solution. Okay. Okay. The other one is mass. Per mass percent. People have a little bit more trouble with this one, but let's look at an example. So it's just simply the mass of something over the mass of the other thing times 100. The mass, the grams of solute over the grams of solution. That's the key word, solution. It doesn't say solvent. It says the grams of the solution. So we have 4.5 grams of platinum and 14 grams of gold. 4.5 grams platinum, and we have 14.0 grams of gold. Okay, we melt those together. What is the concentration of the platinum in the solution? Well, you take the 4.5 grams of platinum, and you divide it, because that's the solute, right? That's the thing in the lesser amount. The solvent is the gold. And I'm going to divide the solute by the mass of the solution. So what number do I put here? 14. No, 18.5. Okay. The solute is 14 grams. The, uh, sorry, the solvent is 14 grams. The solute is 4.5. So you have to add those together to get the mass of the entire solution. 18.5 grams of solution. Okay? And then I take 4.5 and I divide it by 18.5 times 100. Okay? But that's why it's a little tricky. Because people want to put the solvent mass there instead of the solution mass. So make sure you put the mass of the solution of everything. That's the solution. Okay? 4.5 plus 14. Okay, so 4.5 divided by 18.5 times 100 gives me 24.32% platinum. 24.32% platinum in that solution. Okay. They could ask you what is the percent gold in the solution. Here, and then you can take 14 over 18.5 and you can find the percent gold. Okay, now parts per thousand, parts per million. Usually when somebody tells you something in parts per million or thousand, it's because they're looking at something that is very, very dilute. 
it's in very, 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 very low quantities. So if something's in our drinking water, usually it is a very dilute amount and they would record it in parts per thousand or parts per million. Okay? So, you would do grams over grams, grams of solute over grams of solution, basically the grams of water, if it was our drinking water, times, in this case, times a thousand for parts per thousand, or times a million for parts per million. Okay? Sometimes I wonder about these people. The parts per thousand or parts per million, okay? So it's simply the grams per gram percent, except instead of doing a hundred, you do times a thousand or times a million. You could do parts per billion as well. So grams per gram times a billion. And that'll give you the billion parts per billion. Now, what we are mostly going to do is we are mostly going to look at concentration based on moles, okay? Because we love moles. We're chemists and we love moles, okay? And that's basically how we're going to do most stuff. If you see um, solutions in the, in the laboratory and you look at them and how they're labeled, they're labeled in a molar concentration called molarity. And molarity is equal to the moles of something divided by the liter that it's dissolved into. Moles of solute per liter of solution. That is my molarity. That's how I determine the molarity of something. Okay, so here's a very straightforward example. Calculate the molarity of 2.0 liters of solution containing 5 moles of sodium hydroxide. So we're going to use molarity equals moles over liters. We have 5 moles of sodium hydroxide, right? So that's our moles, 5 moles. We have 2 liters of solution, 5 moles divided by 2 liters, and I get 2.5 molar. This solution is 2.5 molar. 5 divided by 2, 2.5. Big M, good. It's big M. Molarity is big M. Don't mi mix that up with uh, MOL for moles. Molarity is moles per liter. MOL is just simply the moles. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's try uh, another example. So, basically, this is the equation molarity equals moles per liters. What are the other types of questions I could ask you here? What are the liters? Or what are the moles? Moles are equal to Good. Liters are equal to? Okay. There we go. That's the three questions I could ask you about molarity. Now. Yes. You'd have to have molarities and moles. And usually molarity, that's the number they would always give you. But the moles, they might not necessarily give you the moles. What could they give you instead of moles? Grams. Yes. Grams. They would give you the grams and say, what is the molarity? So you'd have a volume and you'd have grams and you'd have to convert those into moles and liters so that you can figure out the molarity. Okay, so that's a more realistic example. Let's try this. What is the molarity um, if you have 3.8 grams of sodium chloride in 500 
milliliters of water. Okay, what am I going to have to do first? Convert what? Grams to moles. So I'm going to take my 3.8 grams of sodium chloride and convert it to the moles of sodium chloride from the grams of sodium chloride. Okay, so grams per moles, moles are one. Grams of sodium chloride, something like 58, I believe. You guys can check that if you want. Okay, so 3.8 divided by 58, what does it come out to be? How many moles? Moles? 0 0.065 moles? Okay, so I have 0 0.065 moles. Now, I told you I had 500 milliliters. So if I want to find the molarity, equals moles over the liters. Well, I have my 0 0.065 moles. So I have my volume to go on the bottom. Got to change milliliters to liters. And I hope that if you see 100 milliliters, you'll automatically know where the decimal goes. It goes right up front. So if it's 500 milliliters, it's how many liters? 0.5. Okay, if it's 350 milliliters, then it's 0.35 liters. Okay, so milliliters, hundreds of milliliters will probably be the thing you see the most of. So hopefully you'll just recognize where that decimal goes to put it into liters. All right, now if it was 50 milliliters, it would simply be 0 0.05 liters. Okay, now if you don't want to do that or try to learn that, then simply convert it. 500 uh, from milliliters to the to the liters from the milliliters. There's a thousand milliliters and one liter. 500 divided by a thousand is 0 0.5 liters. Okay. This will always work. So if you're not remembering where to put that decimal or you're not sure, do this. Do the conversion. There's a thousand milliliters in a liter. And that will always work for you. Okay, so 0 0.5 liters. So 0 0.065 divided by 0.5. What's the molarity? 0.13 molar. Okay, so it's the concentration. It tells you how many moles there are in every meter. There's 0.13 moles in every one liter. Okay? That's what the molarity stands for. All right, well, what if I asked you this question? How many grams of magnesium chloride um, dissolve in 250 milliliters of water to make a um, 1.8 molar solution. What am I solving for? Okay. So what equation, what molarity equation am I going to use to get the grams? Am I going to solve for liters? The moles. Good. Because I got to get to the moles so I can get to the grams. So what do moles equal? Molarity times the liters. Okay, go ahead. Okay, what did you find for the moles? Okay, so, um, and then I'm going to change that from moles of magnesium chloride to the grams of magnesium chloride from the moles. How many grams 
per molar there for magnesium chloride. Ninety four, ninety five, ninety four. Okay. So I'm gonna take point four five times ninety four. How many grams are there? Okay. All right. That's my answer. 42.3 grams is how many grams I would dissolve into 250 milliliters to make a 1.8 molar solution. Okay? So that's a very realistic question. You want to make a uh, certain molarity in the lab? That's how you do it. You figure out how many grams you need to dissolve in so many milliliters, and you make it. And now you have a 1.8 molar solution of magnesium chloride that you could use to react with something else. Okay? All right. Now, the next part of this um, is dilution. So, when I dilute a solution, let's say this is one liter, and I have one, two moles. I have two moles of something dissolved into one liter. Therefore, this is a two molar solution. Two divided by one, right? The molarity equals two moles in one liter. So it's two molar. Okay. Now, if I change the volume here to two liters, I just added water, what happens to the number of moles? The moles stay the same. Nothing happened to these, right? There's still two moles in there, right? There's still two moles. But the molarity changes. To what? So the molarity is now equal to two moles in every two liters. So it's one molar. The molarity changed, the volume changed, but the number of moles did not change, right? Because moles equal molarity times liters. So two moles equals one molar times two liters. Or two moles down here is equal to two molar times one liter. The moles stay the same. And because the moles don't change, I can use that fact to create an equation for dilution. And this is the dilution equation. That's not it. Let's find it. M1, V1 equals M2, V2. Or in other words, the moles of one are equal to the moles of two. Because moles equal M1, V1, right? So the moles of one, M1, V1, are equal to the moles of two, M2, V2. So if I wanted to know if I diluted a solution to, uh, I started at one volume and I diluted it to a new volume, and I wanted to know what the new molarity was, <coughs> I can solve for it. M2. M2 equals M1 V1 over V2. Right? And now I can solve for M2. The new molarity of that solution. As long as I understand what the initial volume and molarity were, I can solve for the new molarity. Or I could solve for a volume that I'd want to get to to make it a very specific molarity. If I wanted to dilute it to a very specific molarity, how much water would I have to add, dilute it, so it would reach that, what is the new volume it would have to take? So I would solve for V2 in that case. V2 equals 
m1 v1 over m2. And I solve for the new volume that I would have to reach to create that new molarity. Okay, so let's let's look at some examples there. Calculate the molarity of a solution made by diluting 0 0.05 liters of 0.1 molar HCl to a volume of 1.0 liters. So this is a good thing to do. Make a list. M1, M2, V1, V2. Okay. This is what I'm looking for, my M2, because it's saying calculate the molarity of a solution after dilution. So what is M2 basically? What is the new molarity? Okay, so I'm going to solve for M2, and uh, these are all my numbers that I'm going to use. Okay, so M2 equals M1 V1 over V2. Okay, so my M1, 0 0.1 molar times my V1, which is 0 0.050 liters or 50 milliliters, divided by V2, which is 1.0 liters. So you diluted it to one liter from 50 milliliters. What's the new molarity? And that's how it's all that. And here it is. It's 0 0.005 molar HCl. That's what it ends up being. 0 0.005 molar HCl. Okay, and I would do that. Okay. okay, well, yeah, some of that was part of this, but that was, that was a very different class. <laughs> That's uh, Chem 2, General Chemistry. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, let's practice one more question for dilution. So, your M1 is equal to um, 1.8 molar. Your V2 is equal to, I'm sorry, your V1. So you have a 1.8 molar solution that has a volume of um, 200 milliliters. Um, what is the new molarity? Nope. I want to create a 0 0.9 molar solution. So you're going to have to find V2 and tell me how much water to add. Okay. So I'm going to solve for V2 here. V2 equals M1 V1 divided by M2. So, 1.8 molar times 200 milliliters. You notice what I did? I didn't convert. Why? Because I want, I can find my, it doesn't matter. Not in this case. If I leave it as milliliters, my answer will be in milliliters. If I put it into liters, my answer will be in liters. Because I have liters on both sides, or I have volume on both sides, it doesn't matter if it's liters or milliliters. They will cancel uh, otherwise. Okay? M2, 0 0.9, 0 0.9 molar. Okay, so what's the answer? 400? 400 mils. So you do it. Now, how much water do I add? 400 mils isn't the answer. The answer is, how much water do I add? 200 milliliters. Because your final volume needs to be what? 400. I already have 200 milliliters, so I need to add another 200 milliliters to make it 400 milliliters. So I would add 200 milliliters my already 200 milliliters so that I could make it that way. 